Welcome and thanks for listening to the Way Bible Church podcast. Here at The Way, we're all about life change, and we pray that as you listen to these hope-filled messages that you would be transformed by the love of Jesus. To find out more about us in our service times, location, events, and more, visit twbcss.com today. It says, and Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Amen. I could stop right there. How many of you know you need some fresh life in your life today? Amen. Jesus said, I am that life that you're looking for. I am the resurrection and I am the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And here's the question he's asking all of us in the room this morning. He's asking us this question. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? And I love how she answered him. She answered him and said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God who is coming into this world. And the title of this morning's message is, what happened to me? What happened to me? There's a time in your life when you receive Jesus Christ and you have to know what happened to you on that day. And as I start out this message, I want to read you a quote from Les Brown. And he talks about the richest place on earth. The richest place on earth, Les Brown says this, the graveyard is the richest place on earth because it is here that you will find the hopes and the dreams that were never fulfilled. You'll find the books that were never written, the songs that were never sung, and the inventions that were never shared, the cures that were never discovered, all because someone was too afraid to take that first step or determined to carry out their dream. I read that quote for a reason because many of the believers in this room, if you're not careful, you can live a life that's good, but never reach the full potential of your calling. We can live a life that's good. We can live a life that's effective. We can live a life that even does some kingdom expansion. But if we're not careful, we can get very complacent and we can end up making the graveyard the richest place on earth for many of our lives. And this is why in TWBC in the year 2024, we believe you need community. We need to believe you need community because community is this, it's accountability plus transparency equals community. And accountability simply means this, you can count on me. Come on, somebody. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can count on me. Turn to your neighbor you're not related to and say, you can count on me. Now turn to a third person and say, you can count on me. That's when it gets uncomfortable. Like, because you know this person, you know that person, the third person, you're like, uh, who do I look for? Who do I go after, right? But you can count on me. How many of you know you need people you can count on in the body of Christ, amen? And that's what accountability is at TWBC. There's also transparency. Transparency means Joel's gonna be real about where he is on the journey to becoming who he is. Because how many of you know that you can be, where, what, you can be somewhere, but it doesn't define who you are? How many of you have ever been in a tough place in your marriage? It's where you were, but it did not define who you are. How many of you have ever gone through anxiety or depression? It's where you were, but it should not define who you are. So transparency is being real about where we're at in the body of Christ on the way to getting to who we are called to be in the body of Christ and becoming in the image of Jesus Christ. And that equals community, and community is caring and being cared for where you are. So we can get you the, so we can get the, you help and get you to where you need to be. And if I can illustrate our Christian walk in this message, I want to illustrate it like the class that you took long ago for some of you. For some of you, you're about to take it. It's the class called driver's education. How many of y'all remember driver's ed class? How many of you remember your driver's ed instructor? <laughs> How many of you remember your driver's ed instructor and the look on his face the first time you got on the interstate? right? Like the fear and the panic that took over when the 18 wheeler was coming up beside you. And he's like, Joel, you got to hit the gas and get up to speed because you're going to get ran off the road. Come on, somebody. Oh, y'all weren't perfect drivers in driver's education either. That's because it's called driver's education. And listen, we can spend weeks in the classroom. We can spend weeks in the church. We can spend weeks in worship services. We can spend months and years in the house of God. But listen to this. We can spend weeks in the classroom, but there must be a day when we get behind the steering wheel. There must be a day when we start the engine and put the car into drive and push the gas pedal. Come on, somebody. 
There must be a day in the church when we leave the four walls of the building with an excitement and a passion and a life because of the resurrection and the life and put the gas pedal to the floor and begin to expand the kingdom of God. Can I get an amen this morning? And so if I can illustrate your Christian walk, like driver's ed class, I want to take it a step further. Many of us, myself included, the only reason I endured the classroom is because I wanted to gain the power and the authority to get the license. Now, Rusty, know this. If I didn't have to sit in that class, I would have just been driving anyway. But I had to go through the class and go through the training to get the authority to drive. In your Christian walk, many of you have gone through the classes. You've got the authority. If you're born again, you actually have the power to do things for the kingdom. Jesus this morning wants you to know that he's given you the license to drive this vehicle called the kingdom of God and be effective for the kingdom, but many of us still want to be in class. And I'm telling you this morning, you need to take hold of your license, the power source, the authority that he's given you that comes with the resurrection and the life. And I'm going to spend the whole rest of this message on one verse of scripture to explain to you the power and the authority that you got when Jesus gave you the license called born again. And I love what somebody told me after church this morning. He said, Pastor Joel, the only thing that's the same about me from the day I got born again is the way this body looks. Because I wasn't just reborn, I was also rebuilt. Come on, somebody. I wasn't just reborn, I was rebuilt. I'm a completely different person than I was the day I got born again. Romans 8, 11 says this, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. There is a life awaiting on you for this mortal body to accomplish something amazing for the kingdom of God. And if you are bored with your Christian walk or you are bland in your Christian walk, if your Christian walk has become very vanilla lately, come on, if it's become very plain, I'm telling you there's a life source that you have not tapped into yet. There's a power source that is waiting you to step into it. And the Bible says this, but if, but if, The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. And listen, Easter is all about celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen on that? And we love to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But I think we're missing out on the fullness of the celebration. I think we're missing out on the fullness of the celebration because one of the significant shortcomings of the church as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus is that in celebrating his rising from the dead by the power of God, we forget there should be a simultaneous celebration of my resurrection from the dead by the power of God. As I'm celebrating what Jesus did, I need to celebrate what Jesus has done in me also. It's okay to be excited that he he raised you from the dead. It's okay to be excited that you're born again. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. There should be a simultaneous celebration of what Jesus did or what God did in Jesus and what God did in me. Come on. It's okay to celebrate your resurrection. You are not dead any longer. He didn't raise you from the dead so you could be boring. I'm going to make somebody mad in the room today. He He didn't raise you from the dead so you could celebrate being comfortable. He didn't celebrate raising you from the dead so you could just be complacent with your seat and your person Bible in this one and your spouse in this one and an empty one around you. Let's just make it all mad, right? (laughs) There should be so much celebrating of your resurrection that it influences others. The big thing on all the social medias is who's going to be an influencer? Like I literally saw somebody the other day, never has led a workout class in their life, but they're a fitness influencer. In the church, we need to be more than just an influencer. We need to be impactful. We need to be encountering. We need to be able to get our hands dirty with some folks sometimes. Come on. 
And it goes on to say this. It says, but if, and many people read this, and because our mind is conditioned to think that the terms but and if are questioning terms, they seem to be terms of doubt even in the scriptures. And that being said, people begin to question the scriptures and the will of God for their life. But that term, but if, in the Greek, when you break that down, the actual translation is this. It's more over or more than. So when you read this passage of scripture with more over or more than, it says more over or more than this, the spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Come on. More than just Jesus rising from the dead, the very spirit that raised him from the dead is going to give life to your mortal body. So more than just Jesus rising, Paul's writing to the Romans, more than just Jesus rising, there's a Joel rising. Come on, somebody. There's a Jeff rising. Come on. There's a Marty rising up. There's more than just Jesus rising. And it says, moreover, the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. When you get your driver's license, there's no longer a question if you have power and authority. And when you get pulled over, come on, somebody. Can we just give a hand to all the law enforcement officers in the house and watch it online? Thank you guys for what you do, putting your life on the line. And I've got experience with a police officer because there's been times I've been pulled over. Youth, I'm I'm just being honest. I mean, I like to drive like I like to live 100 miles an hour. Come on, somebody. And the first thing he asks for when he pulls me over, can I see your authority and your power to drive? Can I see your license and registration? Because he wants to know that we have the authority to be doing what we're doing and the power to be doing what we're doing, first and foremost. When you were born again, there is no longer a question of you having power and authority living inside of you because the same power that raised Jesus from the grave lives and dwells in me. When I got born again, God says, Joel, here's a license to the kingdom. And it gives you power and authority to operate in your gifts and your callings as the Holy Spirit is filling you and dwelling inside of you. Come on, somebody. It gives you great authority in the kingdom of God. It says, but if the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Moreover, the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. That term dead wants you to know how dead, dead Jesus actually was. That term dead in the Greek means necros. It literally means one that has breathed its last completely lifeless. But if the same spirit who raised Jesus from a lifeless dead state, Acts 3.15 says this, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead and we are witnesses to this. Listen, Paul's not just writing this to the Romans and the people who had experienced it. You should be saying this. I'm a witness to the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. God told this to the church, and you will be my witnesses. It means you've encountered something. You've experienced something. You've seen something. Come on. I've seen a change in me. I'm a witness to the power of the resurrection of God that is in my life. Romans 4, 17 says, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. Talking about Abraham. He, was, he is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things into being that were not. Here's an amazing thing. I love what Pastor Hunter said this morning. He is the God who can create something out of nothing. He is the God who can give life to the dead and cause those things that be not, that are not, as though they already were. He called Abraham a father before he was a father. He called Joel saved before I encountered Jesus. Come on. He is the God who can give life to the dead and cause things that are not as though they are. This is why accountability is so important because you can count on me and transparency is so important because God's calling you his son and daughter who you are even though your actions may be something different and where you are. See, God calls it as he sees it, not as we see it. And the thing I love about God is he's got so much more faith in Joel than Joel has in Joel. Because he's calling things as he's seeing it, not as my sinful failures have shown it. 
He's seeing born again, blood bought, righteous, holy. He's seeing somebody passionately pursuing God. I don't see myself like that quite yet. But I gotta start seeing it from his perspective, not my perspective. If you didn't realize this, I love what this verse says. It says, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things into being that were not. If we'll grab a hold of this truth, it'll change your life. God specializes in giving life to dead things. God specializes giving life to dead things. And here's something you gotta understand. Some of you have put a dream in a coffin that you should have just gave a pillow to. All right, I'm gonna say it to this side. Some of you have put a dream in a coffin, you've called it dead when you should have just gave it a pillow. Because you've given up on God when he hasn't given up on that dream he put in your heart years ago. Quit giving things a tombstone when you need to give them a bed. Sometimes you need to just give it some time. Let it rest. Let it grow. Let God perfect some things in me till I can get to the point to sustain the actual dream that's been in my heart for years. Come on. I have people ask me this question all the time. Joel, did you ever dream the church would be this? We hadn't even begun to start on my dreams yet. I haven't quit dreaming from day one. This is just the beginning of something God's doing. Come on, somebody. We're 25 years in, and we're still a baby. We're a big baby, but we're a baby. Do not give a tombstone to what God says you need to give a pillow to. There are some of you that have dreams in your heart of doing ministry around the world, going to different continents and preaching and teaching. There's some of you that want to do some things for the kingdom of God that are unheard of right now in the kingdom. And you put that dream on hold because you've never seen it done before. I'm saying it's never been done before because God's waiting on you to do it. He's waiting on you to start it. He's waiting on you to take the step of faith of it. And God specializes in giving life to dead things. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus Christ from the necros, the lifeless state, dwells in you. Now, here's what I love about that term dwells. That term dwells in the Greek means to take up habitation and to make residency at. When Jesus came to the earth, he stayed here for 33 years. Jesus took a trip to the earth. The Holy Spirit moved to the earth. I'm going to say that again. Jesus took a trip to the earth to make a passageway for the Holy Spirit to move to the earth. This is why in the Old Testament, and it's so privileged to live in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, the Spirit would come and rest on people. The New Testament, it's not coming to rest and go back. It's coming to dwell on the inside and stay until we go here, until we go home. The Spirit of God moved residencies from the kingdom of heaven to the heart of Joel. He changed his address from what I like to say, 777 Street of Gold, <laughs> to this body. In my flesh, I would say the Holy Spirit took a downgrade. But God says the Holy Spirit took an upgrade. It pleases the Spirit of God to live on the inside of you. He is more at home living on the inside of you than he's ever been. That is his purpose, to reconnect this lifeless body and put a spirit, his spirit on the inside of me and awaken the dead Joel to an alive Joel with his new life, the spirit life on the inside of me so I can have a relationship with God. The only way you have a relationship with God is because of what Jesus did through the Holy Spirit today. Did you catch how I phrased that? You got to accept and receive what Jesus did. But your relationship comes from the Spirit that has awakened you and the Holy Spirit uniting with your spirit. And now you have a relationship with God because of the Holy Spirit. Now here's where a problem comes in. The God who specializes in giving life to dead things said the life-giving part of me, the spirit, is getting an address change, and he moved into my heart. But my problem comes when how do the dead issues of my life 
remain in my life next to the life-giving Holy Spirit. How, do, how does that unforgiveness rest and reside in my heart right next to the life-giving part of my life, the Holy Spirit? The only way the dead things remain next to the life-giving spirit on the inside of you is because you allow it. Is because we have given my heart permission to stay in unforgiveness. I've given my life permission to stay victim to the addiction. I've given my life permission to open the website up again. I've given my life permission. And as long as I am giving it permission, the dead thing is able to stay right next to the life-giving Holy Spirit. But if I will say I surrender to the life-giving part of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit then takes over that dead thing, come on, and either uproots it and throws it out or resurrects it if it's a godly thing. Come on. You just got to give him, you just got to give him permission. You just have to give the Spirit of God permission in your life to do what he's wanting to do, and that's bring life into dead places. Some of you have some dead hopes and some dead dreams. I'm going to challenge you to bring that to this life-giving Spirit of God. Some of you have some problems in your life that you just think will never be resolved on this side of eternity. And I'm telling you, you're wrong. You just got to submit it and give permission to the life-giving Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead he wants to resurrect some things in your heart. Romans 8, 11. I've read it a million times. I'm going to read it again. But if or moreover the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life. Now those are the four most important words in this verse. Will also give life to your mortal bodies. Mortal means this body is liable unto death. So what we got to understand is you are a spirit being living in an earthly body. You are not an earthly person having a spiritual encounter. You are a spiritual being living in an earthly body. You are not an earthly person having a spiritual encounter. You are spirit. And those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth, the Bible says. And so you got to understand, you are a spirit being first. And God says, I'm not only concerned about resurrecting the spirit being part of you, I'm also concerned about giving life to your mortal bodies because as long as you're breathing air, the Holy Spirit can still operate in the earth. Amen. Come on, somebody. This is the only reason I don't want to die young is because I will no longer be effective for the kingdom of God after I'm, my mortal body is no longer here. So the Bible says he wants to give life. He will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And so that, those four words, give life, will also give life, those terms in the Greek mean zoe poieo in the Greek. And I'm going to break that down just for a second. Zoe comes from the Greek word God life. It's the zoe life of God. It's the God life that he breathed into Adam when he first breathed into his nostrils. It's the God life that you received when you got born again. He breathed into you and you awakened. The dead you came alive. We're celebrating the resurrection of Joel. Come on, somebody. Celebrating the resurrection of you. And you became alive. It's the God life, Zoe. But poieo means this, to do. He's given you God life to your mortal bodies to do. So that term, will also give life, it means this. He's given you God life to do something. Listen, he's given you God life to do this marriage. I know you think it's done, and I know you're fighting, and I know you just got out of the car this morning mad at each other. Come on. Hey, more fights happen on the way to church than any other time. Well, why is that? There, there's a spiritual reason for that. If he can't defeat you, he'll distract you. So he couldn't defeat you because you're coming to church. But now that you're fighting on the way to church, it's going to be a distraction in church. So if he can't defeat you, he'll distract you. But the Bible just says he's given you God life. He's given you God life to do this marriage. I can't stay married if it's not by the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. And if you're married without the Holy Spirit operating in your life, it's about to get a lot better when you invite him in. Come on, somebody. Like, there's so much Joel is still in Joel that's got to be worked out. Come on. Like, I need the Holy Spirit. 
And it's not that old hymn, every hour I need thee. No, it's every minute on the minute. I need you. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I, I hope you all like transparency because <laughs> you're getting it today. I need the Holy Spirit. But he's given me God life to do this marriage. Listen, some of you are struggling in your careers. He's given you God life for the career that you're in. And if you'll do it to the best of your ability and invite the Holy Spirit into that career, he will either change the career or he'll change the career. <laughs> Come on, I'm saying he'll either change the career or he'll change the career. You don't realize you are the atmosphere setting particle in your workplace. You are the one who sets the environment. He's given you God life to do this career. Listen, he's given you God life to be a dad. Come on, all the dads in the room, hold your hand up. He's given you God life to be a father and lead your family to church. He's given you God life to get off the couch and go play ball with your kids. He's given you God life to be more than a deadbeat dad. Come on. He's given you God life to lead and instruct your children in the way that they should go so when they get older, they can encounter God. Come on, somebody. And have God life. Listen, men of the house, I know it's not a popular thing in the culture we live in today, but rise up and be a man. Quit letting this culture emasculate you. Men, get a job. Lead your household to church. Stand up. Help your wife make dinner. Clean the house. Shave. Put deodorant on. Be a man. He's given you God life to be a mom. And moms don't think you got to be a dad. Don't think you got to be a dad. Even if you're a single mom, don't think you have to be the dad. You be the best mom you can possibly be. And trust that God will bring a godly man. Listen, listen to what I'm saying. A godly man to help you have a father figure in your child's life. I'm not saying you need to sit here praying, oh, he's going to bring me a godly man to get married. That's not what I said. There are godly men in this church who will stand up and be an example to young people who don't have a father figure in the home. Come on, somebody. Amen. Moms, be moms. He's given you God life to be a mom. He's given you God life to be single. If he's given me God life to be married, he's given some of you God life to be single. Quit looking for the next thing, the next one, the next encounter, the next experience. Make that encounter, that experience, Jesus Christ himself. He's given you God life to overcome whatever challenges you're facing. You're an overcomer. You're more than a conqueror, the Bible says. He's given you God life to face whatever you're facing. Listen, people who tell you God's not going to put more on you than you can handle are a liar. And that is nowhere in Scripture. God will put more on me than I can handle because it will cause me to have to have a reliance on him. Come on. But as soon as I surrender, the weight of the challenge begins to go away. John, my biggest struggle is I think I'm so strong in my own power, I don't surrender till I'm about to die. Because I don't want to bother God. I'm just going to go on, quit talking about myself. I'm mad. God's given you God life for that battle. Some of you are battling sicknesses and illnesses and you're ready to give up. He's given you God life. He's given you God life for it. And you don't have to do life alone either if you're battling an ailment or a sickness or a disease. We have prayer partners that are up here. Don't do it alone. Amen. Don't fight it by yourself. If you're struggling with an addiction or a pornography or, or anything like that, don't fight it by yourself. Because if you could have already defeated it, you already would have. You need the body of Christ. We need community. He's given you God life to do this battle. He's given you God life to write that book. I believe we got some authors in this room that you haven't even begun to write because who would want to read what I wrote? Why not start? Why not now? Why not try? Why not step out there and just begin to put pen and paper together? Listen, it's even easier than that now if you got a computer. You can just hit speech dictate and talk. The problem is they don't, the, uh, Apple or, or PC don't speak Texan. <laughs> I've learned this. Like they don't speak Texan. You got to go back and do some corrections, okay? That's what Grammarly's for. Come on, somebody. You got to love it. Some of you need to start writing songs. 
Some of you need to start dreaming again. Some of you have been so indoctrinated by the negativity in our culture from all the media outlets, from social media to television to news broadcast, you don't even have a dream anymore. The worst thing for a believer to have is not having a dream. To live a life as a believer and not have a dream, not have an aspiration, not have a hope that God can use you for something greater than, you, than you're doing right now. And he's given you God life to dream again. He's given you God life to look at your spouse and dream again. And say, it's gonna get better. There's better days around the corner. Let's keep fighting. We are worth fighting for. He's given you God life to dream. He's given you God life to be the believer that this world needs. And I'm not talking about getting on a plane and going to South America. I'm talking about when you go to the grocery store. He's given you God life to play with somebody on aisle 13. When you're walking into the parking lot, he's given you God life to help somebody put their groceries away and pray with them in that moment. I remember doing more ministry in the parking lot of a grocery store when I was working full time at the grocery store than I ever did at an altar call on Sunday morning. Because I had a two minute captive audience. And my first question as soon as we walked out the door was, is there anything I can pray for you about today? And sometimes you get, no, baby, I'm good. And sometimes I would get in trouble because 20 minutes later, they're still crying and I'm still trying to go back inside to sack more groceries. But he gave me God life to do it. He's given you God life this morning. And here's the greatest thing. And I'll close with this. Worship team, you can come on out. While we're celebrating the rising of Jesus Christ from the dead and his new life, Listen to this, heaven, heaven is celebrating the God life to do in your mortal bodies today. Hebrews 11 says this, or sorry, yeah, Hebrews 11, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, you know what the apostle Paul's doing right now? He's up in heaven as I'm reading his writing to the Romans saying, I wrote that to you too. I believe in you just like I believed in them. You got heaven cheering you on. You got all the angels of heaven ready to move and be dispatched at your calling. Come on. You got heaven on your side. And all of heaven is not bemoaning you thinking that you're being horrible. All of heaven is celebrating you thinking, when will they just rise up to their potential? Because we see in them what they can't see in themselves. That's why it's called in our walk of the mortal bodies, faith going to take faith it's going to take faith for you to walk out in the God life to do it's time to start celebrating the resurrection on the inside of you 